This is Lindsay De Hoyas. Um, hello, uh, committee members and chair. I would like to share my personal experience. I am here representing the Arizona Association of the Deaf Central Region, and I am also the mother of a deaf child, um, and I've got a second baby on my way. I'm a former educator at the Phoenix State School for the Deaf. Uh, I worked there for six and a half years, but I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. I have very strong early intervention program in Boston. I moved here seven years ago, and I have a strong basis for comparison from Boston to um, my experience teaching at PDSD. Uh, very significant disparities between the two programs. Um, I have many deaf friends and those that I know in the community in Boston um, are successful. Many are doctors, lawyers, educators, um, and they all have jobs. They're all doing very well. Uh, and that really begins with a very strong early intervention program that they have in Boston. Um, I have a master's degree as well myself, having grown up in Boston. When I became a teacher here in Arizona, I saw that there were a lot of students who were severely delayed in their language development, and it broke my heart. They do have potential. It was just that because of the program here lacking in resources, um, they were at a disadvantage. We have 1.1 million Arizonans with some level of hearing loss in our state. Um, and if we are to assist those children, we need to improve earlier intervention, and that will make a significant impact on our community. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? No, thank you. And next? Annette Reichman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Chairman Kavanaugh and members of the committee, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Just to let you know, I'm not able to speak quickly, so I can't do a presentation in five minutes. I will, however, commit to doing it in 10 minutes, so bear with me. I want to start with a story. Last fall, I read a little article in a newsletter. The newsletter is written by our Early Childhood and Family Education Program. This article is written by Christy Lawrence, who happens to be here, and she will be testifying to you shortly. She describes here the challenges of providing early intervention services to families that have infants and toddlers who are visually impaired in the northern Arizona region, especially the Navajo Nation. And she has this picture here of this lonely dirt road with the endless horizon. She does that every day. She goes out, she meets with parents wherever they are at on the reservation. At the end of the article, she talks about one girl a two-and-a-half-year-old girl who's visually impaired. They were sitting outside with no toys in sight, nothing to play with. That girl picked up an empty soda can and started looking for and finding small little pebbles to put into the soda cans. So they took turns looking for and finding those pebbles and putting them into the soda can. At the end of the article, I'm going to quote her directly, she says, that day she, that little girl, worked on her vision, her eye-hand coordination, her fine motor skills, her depth perception, and turn taking. Wow, I couldn't have planned it better than that. This is a terrific example of what our teachers do each and every day. Now, you here, your parents, you are grandparents. You have children and grandchildren. Let me ask you, when your child was born, how did you know how to take care of that child? Well, you learn from your parents, you learn from your grandparents, from your extended family, from your friends. If, however, 
you have a child that's born deaf or blind or even deaf blind would you then as a parent know how to take care of that child would you know how to create a home environment that's accessible to your child so he and she can learn? Probably not. And we do have a parent right here, Brittany, that will be speaking with you later. She will describe that experience. This is what we do with early intervention. We go into the homes and we provide training to the parents on how to create learning opportunities for their children who are deaf and who are blind. Specifically for deaf children, language, access to language. If you don't hear, you're not picking up on language. And as you all know, that zero to three is a critical time period to be able to access language. For blind children, it's really developing visual spatial concepts knowing what's around them in their immediate environment, and learning independent living skills. We have clinical studies that show that the investments in early intervention, early detection and early intervention, pays off down the road. When these children have the early intervention, by the age of three, they're ready for preschool. Then they're ready for kindergarten. Then they're ready for elementary school, for middle school, for high school, and post-high school training and employment. Today, when we look around at adults who are deaf, about 60% of them are employed. When we look at adults who are blind, about 42% of them are employed. And that is a direct consequence of the domino effect we have from the early ages all the way through the schools being behind and then not having the skills they need to get gainful employment. And by the way, those two numbers that I just quoted you, that's compared to over 70% of the general population being employed. So when we talk about our programs here, we've been so successful with our early detection of infants and toddlers who are deaf and who are blind that the number of parents choosing to accept services from ASDB has increased dramatically. In 2011, we were serving 257 families. In 2017, we served 433 families. You may wonder, how many teachers do we have? 17. 17 teachers in 2011, 17 teachers in 2017. And today, we have 17 teachers. Those 17 teachers do home visits over 110,000 square miles. That is, all of Arizona. So when we have more families that we are providing services to, that means we are decreasing the optimal four times a month home visits per family. That has gone down from four to an average of two home visits per family per month. And the rural areas, quite frankly, it's down to one home visit per month. You may wonder, why is that important? Well, in addition to the research that I just talked about, ASDB has its own data that shows there is a correlation between the number of home visits per month and successful exit outcomes at the age of three. Specifically, what do I mean by that? Well, we have three benchmarks, and I'm going to go th through those three with you. The first benchmark is social emotional developmental skills. In 2010, seven of the 10 
three-year-olds that we served exited at age appropriate developmental skills in social emotional skills. In 2017, four out of 10. Cognitive skills, the second benchmark in 2010, seven of the 10 three-year-olds exited the program at age appropriate skills. In 2017, four out of the 10. Communication skills. In 2010, five of the 10 exited the program at three years old at age appropriate communication skills. Not great, that needed to be improved. However, in 2017, that too reduced to three out of 10. So as you can see, more of our three-year-olds right now are not ready for preschool. And that creates, like I just said, a domino effect that affects that child's life because she or he may never catch up. So this is why we're here today. The bill before you will allocate 1.6 million to hire 21 new teachers to the program. That would make it possible for us to get closer to the optimal four home visits a month per family on an average. And you may be aware that in addition to the $1.6 million in the bill before you, the governor is proposing a one-time separate $470,000 to purchase vehicles so that our new teachers can be driving around the state. With that, we fully expect better exit outcomes that our three-year-olds will exit with age-appropriate linguistics, academic, independent living, self-navigation, and social skills. And with that, as young adults, they're much more likely to get good jobs with advancement opportunities. And by the way, we will close the gap between urban and rural services. So in closing to you today, Chairman Kavanaugh and members of the committee, I really do ask that for the sake of our children that you make this budget request a priority during the legislative budget negotiations. With that, I would like to make myself available for questions. Any questions? Oh, no, Phil, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Brittany Buchanan. Mr. Chair Kavanaugh, members of the committee, for the record, I am Brittany Buchanan, and I'm here to testify in favor of HB 2022. I have a two and a half year old daughter in addition to my five year old. My two and a half year old daughter, her name is Corinne, and she is multiply disabled. And in addition to that, she is also blind deaf. She started with early intervention services by two months old. I knew about her disabilities while I was pregnant, so we were able to anticipate those and get into the program um, very quickly when she was born. Um, our services include vision and hearing therapies through Foundation for Blind and ultimately through the Arizona School for the Blind and the Deaf. Um, our vision or our hearing teacher is Mary Ann and I honestly stand here and tell you I don't know what my life would look like with my blind deaf daughter if it wasn't for our hearing, I'm sorry, my hearing, th our hearing therapist. Um, she single-handedly has shown me how to communicate with my daughter how to, how, how to help my son integrate his play and his love for his sister into her world, because her world is vastly different than ours. Um, and we thrive now as a family because of our hearing therapist, Marianne. Um, Corinne uses a combination of English spoken sign, hearing aids, soon to be cochlear implants, 
hopefully an, aug an augmentative communication device, flashcards, and her vision, the way she gazes at things to communicate with us. And that was all facilitated by the fact that we had a supportive hearing therapist who, by the way, only comes to our house once a month for 60 minutes. So all of my daughter's communication, all of my communication, my husband's communication, my son's communication with our daughter and her communication back to us has only been facilitated over the past two and a half years, less a few months, by one therapist and 60 minutes each month. Um, this isn't enough. It's not enough for me to only know a handful of signs to communicate with my daughter. Um, it's not enough for me to use the limited flashcards to communicate with my daughter. I'm a hearing parent. My son was born typical, and then I had a daughter that is blind deaf, and I didn't know how to parent that before she came into my life. And I don't think many parents in that position know how to parent th that child, but our hearing therapist is the one that she kind of was the one that was like, it's okay, this is how we do this, and this is how I'm going to help you do this. Um, she's literally been our lifeline for those 60 minutes once a month to be the mother of my daughter. Um, Corinne's first Christmas, she was three months old, and um, I went to Toys R Us to buy my kids gifts, and I realized that every single infant toy relies on sight and sound, which we weren't sure my daughter had any sight. We didn't really, we hadn't tested her hearing concretely yet, so we really didn't know how much she could hear. So I really, I sat there and cried <laughs> in Toys R Us because what was I going to get my daughter? What was I ever going to get my daughter for Christmas, for her birthday, for Easter, for anything? Um, I left the store empty-handed and the next day when nine o'clock rolled around I immediately picked up the phone and I called my hearing therapist Marianne I was like Marianne what um, what do I get current for Christmas everything needs your sight or your hearing and there's nothing and she after a couple minutes she called me down she's like it's okay you treat her like you would always treat any child and you don't know, but that's okay. You can get her something and we can work on it um, next month for 60 minutes. <laughs> so she was, she's always been instrumental through Corinne's life, um, showing me that A, it's okay to be upset or be sad, but to work through that and teach my daughter my world as an, in addition to her helping us learn my daughter's world. Um, I would give almost anything to have Marianne in our house for 60 minutes, four times a week. Um, it would be, it's worth anything to me because that Corinne also, she doesn't sit up, she doesn't walk, she doesn't crawl, she doesn't reach, she doesn't grasp, she doesn't eat, she's G-tube dependent. All she has is communication, but blind deafness really stands in that, has a huge barrier of her communication. And that's where Marianne bridges the gap for us. Um, she, I'm very incredibly indebted to Marianne and ASDB for their dedication, even though it's one hour a month, to our family. And Marianne goes above and beyond anything that should ever be expected of her just because it is literally one visit a month. Um, honestly, there should never, ever, ever be any type of value placed on being able to communicate I love you to your child. And Marianne helps me communicate I love you to my daughter. And with that, I'd like to be available for any questions. Has, uh, has, has the internet provided you or your daughter with any educational opportunities? Um, what I find on the internet is through Marianne, there's obviously there's very much out there. But um, with ASL, there's different ways to do signing. And one way doesn't work for my daughter, as w but a different way works. But if I just Google ASL and this, like this word, um, I'll get a different response depending on what type of sign.
So Marianne is there to help us find what works best for our daughter and for our family and implement that. Any other questions? Sure. Yes, Senator Smith. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, and this might be for Annette too, I'm not sure, but um, number one, are you finding either one of you that with technology, whether it's hearing aids or implants, that, 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 that a child born deaf or blind has a chance at getting uh, some hearing and or some sight with anything new medically technology related, uh, maybe as opposed to 10, 15 years ago. So are there better implants today? Are there better hearing aids today that can help restore any um, uh, vision or hearing impairment? My first question. So, if, do you do you have an, any anything to that? I can only personally speak for my daughter and her specific syndrome. She has sensory neural hearing loss due to a congenital cytomegalovirus infection while pregnant, and um, with the CMV, it causes lifelong it can cause lifelong progressive hearing loss. So, actually, when she was born, um, she could hear out of both ears, and then she quickly progressed to mild loss, and then six months after that, moderate loss. She was stable at that for a year, and we just found out she is profoundly deaf in her left ear. So she will, even with a cochlear and hearing aid, she will never regain hearing like how she heard prior to losing her hearing. And from our understanding, being told from the audiologist to us as hearing parents, um, cochlear can give sound and hearing, but it's not like how we hear. Sure, and Mr. Chairman, I guess that's kind of what I was wondering, even if it's somewhat distorted or very different, does the technology still exist that, you know, a once thought permanent deaf or blind with seemingly no chance of, of hearing or seeing, is that changed a little bit? So it sounds like possibly. I guess my other question too, and again, maybe for Annette, um, with these funds, do we in anticipate hiring more teachers to have more frequent visits to homes like yours, or there's more children that are out there or even adults that need, that aren't getting any teachers. So are we just getting more teachers um, to service more people or to provide more time with existing people? Right now we're getting more teachers to provide more time to parents like Brittany. Um, so I don't think there's more families out there. If there are, then we've not identified them. So the intent here is really to get at one visit on the average um, per week, if we can do that. Um, going back to your other questions, yes, there's tremendous technological improvements with digital hearing aids and with cochlear implants. In fact, I am profoundly deaf. Um, in 2011, I made the choice to get cochlear implants. I have two of them. Um, I grew up with progressive hearing loss. So in my early years, two hearing aids were sufficient to give me access to the spoken English. But the progression of the hearing loss got worse each year until at the age of 21, I became profoundly deaf. 30 years later, fast forwarding here, got two cochlear implants. Within six months, I was functionally hard of hearing again. So it does create tremendous improvement. It doesn't make me a person who can hear like you hear. If you chatted with me in the bar, sorry. Senator Kavanaugh, you're going to have to <laughs> sign with me. Notice she said you, not me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be able to hear in so, a noisy environment. Yes. I, I can sign in the bar. <laughs> 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 can so, try to do that. Um, so, but here in this environment, awesome, I do hear a lot more. So, again, you try to provide every opportunity to every child and every parent. And the parents then are able to make decisions about what they think is best for their individual child. That's the intent here. So Mr. Chairman then, so this $1.6 million would directly lead to one visit per week rather than one per month that is currently going on now, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Okay.